over the last 60 or so years, they have evolved to become unbelievable athletes. I don't think there is a four-legged individual that can do more than these dogs. They're just a humbling bunch of unbelievable travelers. Often we travel along wolf tracks or sometimes wolves and they have put their ancestors to shame by, of course, by being fed, trained, and, and exercised right uh, and treated right. They, they outrun the, any other animal uh, on this earth. Uh, and they do it, you know, day after day. It's just phenomenal what they can do. And of course, we put the time in. Like I said, the 100 hours that they're not running on an Iditarod is, is a busy time for me where I have to make sure I give them the right uh, amount of uh, food, nutrition, love, attention, massage, uh, chief cook and bottle washer all at the same time. Now that we're on the north side of the Alaska Range, we might see some bare ground, you know, the, the, the moisture will have dropped out. We might cross an occasional glacier. This is really not a glacier per se. A glacier would stay year round. This is just a simple uh, ice formation of a artesian well that keeps seeping out of the mountain year round. And in the winter time, of course, it creates a pretty good sized glacier that this picture doesn't do it justice. But it, it's a pretty challenging. And because of the, the nature of the ice formation, a very slippery uh, formation, but that gives way to some pretty bare ground. Uh, 60 to 80 miles of this is not unusual. And that's, of course, when you, I think I made it upright this year. I have sort of one of my mini Achilles heels is there's a hump that I just, I'm gonna fall. I just know I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold on too. But I'm gonna fall and I'm gonna do one or two barrel rolls, you know, and everything you better be tied down and zipped up, shut and, and secure because there's that one mound that just goes down and around, and for some reason I just can't keep my sled upright. And of course, my dogs know that, so they, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay, they, they get the five minutes where they're in charge, you know, they get to buck off the guy. But I made it this year, so I was pretty happy that that's not at all unusual since we're, since we're on the north side of the, of the Alaska Range, so where the wind blows, where it's relatively dry. Um, Sled dogs are only this incredibly good because we don't have a lot of snow in Alaska. Alaska is more of an arid desert than anything else. There, there really is not that much snow. Otherwise, the dogs couldn't do what they're doing. They couldn't run 150 or 280 miles a day. Um, if we ever need snowshoes, we know we're done. I mean, there was races where Timmy Osmore would be on foot, and then I would come back behind him on snowshoes, and then somebody else on snowshoes, and then the fourth person would drive the four dog teams. And they're talking, you're making, you know, a mile an hour progress. You're breaking trail that way. So then when Timmy was worn out, he would get on the sled, and then I would take off my snowshoes, because you can't snowshoe in, you know, four foot of snow, where you actually literally thrown yourself into the fresh snow. And then the snowshoer, Didi, would snowshoe, and Susan Butcher would be yelling behind us. And uh, we just take turns, you know. Rick Swenson was two miles back, just taking a coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> so, glare ice, you know. Um, if I have glare ice at home, great, I go out and train on it. Usually, about the second week, third week of October, we do glare ice training. Uh, the people that don't, they wish they had but by the time they get onto the farewell lakes. You know, in, in dog training, there's, there's opportunities that are, are hard to find, and stuff like that is kind of hard to find if you're, if you're a mere mortal. So when you have a situation where it's blowing or where it's glare ice or where it's, where it's real slippery, if you want to be successful on the trail, you probably should go out and practice on it. So when people call me and say, hey, it's too cold to run or it's too windy to run, I say, okay, I'm going. It's just a different mindset. You know, what sets, the, what sets the winner apart is being able to deal with just about any situation. And the Farewell Lakes, of course, and the, and the so-called burn, where we literally to this day pick our way through about 380,000 acres of burned trees, those are challenges that the dogs just need to uh, trust you. Just imagine I'm, I'm free running my dogs all summer long and we jump in those, in those lakes to cool them off. And then by the middle of October, I'm going to ask him to go over that lake on foot. That takes some trust. And sometimes it takes me going out there and dancing on the lake and telling him, you can make it. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a 
continue the evolution of working working with your dogs and trusting them. When did the burn happen? Is it burn happened in, in 1974, 1975. And no trees have ever come back? Mm -hmm. you? They're starting to come back right now. It's like time-lapse photography. If you only go through there once a year, you know, you see this tree and, and, and you pay attention where you're going, you know, so now it's kind of choop, 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 choop. it's kind of cool. It's really neat to me. Uh, if you only do it once or twice, it's no big deal, but having, having just done my 26th time, it's, it's really cool. Right now, there's a lot of revegetation happening. And it's no, it's pretty soon it shouldn't be called the burn anymore because it's, it's really not a burn anymore. You know, you can still see lots of burnt trees, but it's been a long time. See, I'm going, I'm going awfully slow, just like I did this year. <laughs> Once you pass the burn, you get a totally different uh, trail experience. Now, all the challenge, the first challenging 250 miles are over. And now you're, now you're leapfrogging your same competitors. Um, and the trail has been. Uh, more forgiving. We're looking back at the Alaska Range. You see the mountains we just have come over, but now their challenges change a little bit. Now we're doing some river traveling, some some mining roads will will greet us uh, until we get into what I call the deep interior, where there is very very little traffic. Um, so it's teamwork. This is a picture taken at the coldest that I have raced through, 63 below actual temperature. <laughs> What happens with a dog at 60 below is really phenomenal. And when I started wearing my clothing system that's called Northern Outfitters, which is a monolithic system, one layer, one layer per customer, very much like the dogs, then I became a better dog driver because I finally could understand how an individual can be warm at 60 below. That's why I told one of the young people here that, um, Take the cold out of the equation. Just think that you're comfortable, and then run the other If you have the right gear, you'll be comfortable most of the time. And that's why the dogs, but the dogs do it for a totally different reason, of course. They, they stay comfortable because they don't perspire on their body. You're only uncomfortable or cold because you've got moisture evaporating from wherever it condensed. Now if you have a monolithic, if you have one layer system and that condensation happens on the outside, you stay dry and because you stay dry, you stay warm. And the inch of layer of dry foam around you or insulation keeps the body temperature from, from, your, from your hundred and so body temperature to ambient temperature. And the condensation happens on the outside. So the, the, the gradient is gradual from, from body to ambient temperature and the condensation is on the outside and you stay warm, whether it's 30 above or 60 below. And that's really, really hard to comprehend. My gear that works for me from start to finish gets better the colder it is. And that, that takes some getting used to. Now when you, think, when you think about it, of course, that's what these dogs have. Now we put blankets over them and coats and all that, but they only have one coat per customer and they better keep them warm. And they're phenomenal how they can stay warm. Plus, of course, the good thing about 60 below, it's warmer somewhere else. <laughs> it's too cold to really rest. It's too cold to really do much. So you just run five minutes, and you wear everything, including your sleeping bag. And then after five minutes of running, you're so darn hot, you've just got to ride the runners again. And you know, then within five minutes, you're freezing cold again. So you just keep on going, and it's going to be warmer somewhere else. And that would be your salvation. <laughs> Of course, this person doesn't know how to race at all. <laughs> they, they don't want to age. I mean, I, I don't want to age, so I do the what I call the Norton Sound facelift, and that's you expose your face to the cold, and you flash freeze your skin, and at the finish line, you peel off that top layer, and you, you throw it away, you know? I'm 85 years old, and I think I'm, I think I'm doing okay, right? <laughs> Of course, it gets dangerous when it gets really, really cold, uh, and you do have to protect. I peeled my fingers pretty good this year, but maybe running two cold thousand mile races contributed. This this middle finger uh, is not from frostbite.